Hello. I just wanted to um, talk to you guys for a little while. Um, I've had something um, that I wanted to talk about. God's been really talking to me about it in all different kind of ways lately. And um, I know that he wants me to tell you today because I woke up this morning and he was there urging me almost like pushing from behind to get on and to talk to you about this today. Um, it's going to make the enemy mad and it's going to make God glad. So we're going to, my job is to give the devil a black eye for the glory of God. And that's what I want you to know. Every trick, every scheme that the enemy uses in our life. And there's some things that are so deep and so hidden and so familiar that we don't even see them. And so, hey, my cousin, be good to me. Don't give me a hard time. Um, I want to talk to you about spiritual DNA today. Um, a lot of people understand um, earthly, like your, your body's DNA. And they understand that there's, um, you can inherit diseases and, and traits and behaviors and things like that. But did you know that you have a spiritual DNA as well? And a lot of times those traits and those behaviors are actually carried down and they're not actually in the blood. They're more in the, in the spirit of a man. And so it's really interesting to me, you know. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody this weekend and they were saying, you know, they found it funny that there was a child who was not raised around their parent. And they were saying that they noticed this child um, had so many traits of this parent that you would think would be learned behavior. Um, just from the way they moved their hands, the way they ate, the way that they would just laugh or um, just act things out or be silly and use the same little silly voice that this parent, that they were not really around very much, um, but this child, though they were not around that parent, they, they still had these traits and these behaviors and it really didn't make sense. But it goes to show you that it's really a spiritual thing. And it's deeper than we think it is. It's it's not something learned behavior. And so I really want to get into that because I know this is the scheme of the enemy. Is um there's some things in our spiritual DNA that we gotta get rid of, that we gotta recognize and we gotta get rid of. That's part of the battle, and that's part of the victory that we can have through Christ. Um so I just want to give you some background and some different little um Chris Kelly, you better watch yourself. So, I want to give y'all some background um, here and um, talk to y'all about in the, the word, in the history of the Bible, and just show you some different situations to, to give you some background. So, first, let's go to Exodus 20 and 5. Well, you know what? We're going to pray first because I feel like we need to. So, we just want God to anoint this message, get rid of any distractions that are trying to come because the enemy will use people to distract you because he doesn't want this message getting out. He'll send people to come, you know, call you from another room. He'll send phone calls. He'll send text messages. He'll put it on somebody to, to come get you, to pull you away because he does not want you to know this because it, it pulls back the cover and reveals everything that the enemy is doing in our life. But not only our life now, but from the generations before and most importantly, the generations that come after us. And, and we really, really want to be able to tag the enemy, get him out of there so that our babies and our babies' babies, um, like that little one right there, so that they um, will be free and not have to suffer um, what they don't have to suffer. So anyway, and um, God, I just want to come before you today, and I thank you for anointing this message. I thank you, Lord, for touching every heart whose eyes are on it, Lord. Every ear be opened, every eye be opened in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that their spirit and their soul is able to receive this, Lord, that they grab a hold of it, Jesus, and that they do something with it, Lord, that it just the eyes of their spirits be enlightened today in Jesus' name. And I thank you, God, that this changes lives, this changes futures and, and, and just just changes the world ultimately, Lord, for your glory, God. Let your people have new knowledge. Let people who, who don't even know that much about you be drawn into this message, Lord, and let them learn something new, Lord, a deeper thing, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. It's very important that you know this 
okay? I don't know that it's taught in every church. This is kind of a deeper understanding, you know, it kind of get it's, it's, it's really, really cool, but it's more than being cool. It's just so important. So just pay attention, okay? Let's hang with me. Exodus 20 and 5 is where we're going to start. And um, it's talking about God's people. The little background is God's people. They were um, starting to worship idols. You know, they were starting to, to go into sin. Okay? And so, lo the Lord tells them in Exodus 25, You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's sin to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Okay, so this, this concerns your babies. This concerns your babies' babies. But what I really also want you to see today, that you're somebody's baby. So what has carried down from the third and fourth generation to you? What is affecting you that came before you? Okay, so I want you to really think this. I want to clean out the bloodline. That's what we've got to do is cleanse our bloodline. Right, because think about this, if something's coming down from the third and fourth generation and those generations are reacting and responding in the same way that their fathers did, well, it keeps carrying down to more third and fourth generation. It keeps flowing down. Okay, so we want to get rid of these things. We want to we want to see that they're there. We want to expose them so that we can uproot them. Okay, so anyway. So let's go over. I want to show you once again. He says it in Numbers 14, 17. We're going to start at 17. I'm just going to give you a little background. It says, So now may the Lord's power be magnified, just as you have spoken. The Lord is slow to anger and rich in faithful love, forgiving the wrongdoing and rebellion. He wants to forgive us. He does not want this for us. Okay? It's just the natural way of the Spirit that these things happen, okay? But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's wrongdoing on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Please pardon the wrongdoing of this people in keeping with the greatness of your love, just as you have forgiven them in Egypt until now. So, basically, the Lord's saying... He will not leave the guilty unpunished, bring the consequences of the father's wrongdoings on the children to the third and fourth generation. Parents, everything you do affects your babies on a spiritual level. Whether you live for God or not affects your babies. It doesn't matter what you can give them in a material way. It doesn't matter all the things you buy for them, it doesn't matter. All the places you take them, it's what your and you can talk about God all day long, but it's how you live your life. You can be a Christian all day long, but it's how you live your life. What's carrying down? No, one second, please. You go. No, go. I'm sorry, my kids. I'm trying to keep them in line. <laughs> so, um, anyway. Go. Go. Thank you. So, like I said, the enemy does not want this message to happen. I get distracted easy and he's going to send every distraction he can. As I was saying, parents, what you do how you live your life. You might say, I'm grown. My kids, they grown. What I do concerns me. That's wrong. Whatever sin you have in your life goes down to the third and the fourth generations onto your children. That darkness slides down your lineage and it affects the ones you love. You know, and so even if your children are small and you think they have all this time, what you're doing right now, you don't know you don't know the, the levels that the enemy is using you to have things come down onto your children. And just because you're a drinker doesn't necessarily mean your children will drink. 
But because you gave the devil legal access, legal right to your bloodline, because now that you see what I'm teaching, you now have a responsibility. You know, how are you giving the enemy legal right to your bloodline? And so whatever you do, he might come in and it might skip a generation and go down to that next one. And there comes the alcoholism again. Or it might be something worse. But because it's not alcoholism, it's a spirit of addiction. You're welcoming the spirit of addiction. So you might have an addiction to alcohol. But what if that spirit of addiction attacks your child somewhere else and they can't get off pills? Or that child can't get off crack, you know, or that child can't get off pornography. It's an addiction or it inherited some other kind of darkness, some other kind of way through your life. And you really need to think about this because it's your babies and your baby's babies and your baby's babies down the generations that are going to inherit your spiritual DNA. And so it's so important that you recognize this and that you say, you know what, God, please reveal to me how the enemy uses me. How is the enemy trying to get into my bloodline or who's been here all this time that I have not recognized or I have not acknowledged that needs to go? Because this is a spiritual battle we're fighting. And we have got to understand the way the enemy uses us. The, God told me once, several times, he kept telling me over and over and over. Because I, I study spiritual warfare and things like this. I want to know about the deeper things of God. I want to know about how the spirit works, you know. And God kept telling me, you have a very strategic enemy. You must learn to be strategic with him. And so, this is what this is. It's learning to be strategic with the enemy. Who hates your soul. He hates the souls of your children. He hates anything that could belong to God and go and, and be in the presence of God because he cannot. And so we are um, here today to learn things that we never thought about, okay? Or just to get a little bit more knowledge maybe on things that we never thought about. And that's awesome to me because I want to help you. I want to help me. I want to teach things that I need to think about. I want to teach things that I need to know. To know. Things that God's shown me that has just opened up a new place and that exposes the enemy and so he's able to be washed out and he no longer has victory. And God gets the victory. God gets the glory. And then my children who are in my spiritual DNA get to flourish. So we talked about Exodus. We talked about Numbers. God says that the, 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 the curse will go down to the third and fourth generations, right? And like I said, it can be carried down to the third and fourth generation from that. If y'all, if people keep, keep keeping this on, keeping it going, always saying, oh, well, it just is how we, this is just how we are. This is just who they were. But it doesn't have to be. And if you will ask God to please show me the things, that, it's in my DNA that need to go so I can get rid of them. You repent of them and you actively pursue them to get out of your life. The Bible says if you submit to God, you resist the devil, he will flee. Now, that resisting doesn't just happen one day. You're like, I resist you. Goodbye. The devil doesn't give up till he knows he does not have a right back in. Just because Adam and Eve were God's children didn't stop the devil from coming in there and saying, Hey, psst, check this out. Right? And because... They listened to him, and not only listened to him, they, they acted with him. How many generations have been affected since then? All. So there's power. There's such power. If God can get in your DNA, if, God, I mean, if Satan can get in your DNA, but we want God to have the victory in our DNA. We want our children to have the victory. We want our parents to have the, the victory because what they're doing is coming down on us. And yeah, we might be we might belong to Christ, but we still have a there's still, still a spiritual aspect going on. And the enemy will continue to see if he has a legal right to come in because he he will never stop pursuing you until you die. He will never stop coming after you to see if he can plant himself in your DNA, if you will accept him and if he can carry it down to those generations. He'll never stop. He didn't stop any time in the Bible when they were God's people, 
And he was victorious many, many times. Because why? God's people gave him an ear. God's people gave him, by giving him an ear and giving him a platform, so to speak, you're giving him legal right into your life. And so, let's go to Ezekiel 18. And let me read there for you. Um, 14 through 32. Now, suppose he has a son who sees all the sins of the father. This is the good news. Suppose a man has a son who sees all the sins of his father that he has committed. And though he sees them, he does not do likewise. He does not. So this is saying it's coming down the generations, this sin. And there's a, there's a man who recognizes it and says, wait a minute. What they did was not right in the eyes of God. Okay. Um, he does not eat at the mountain shrines. He does not raise his eye to, eyes to idols. Um, he does not defile his neighbor's wife. He doesn't oppress anyone. He doesn't hold collateral. He doesn't commit robbery. He gives his bread to the hungry. He covers the naked with clothing. He keeps his hand from harming the poor, not taking rest or profit on a loan, interest or profit on a loan. He practices my ordinances and follows my statutes. So God says, such a person will not die for his father's iniquity. He will certainly live. So how many times are we ignoring what our family, our father's fathers are doing? And sometimes we also accept it and say, well, that's just how my family is. And so that's just how we are. But you must realize when you become a part of Christ, you're now in his DNA. You have his blood that takes over. And if you will recognize, that's when you start recognizing these things that start coming up because now you have Christ's DNA in you and it's not pleased with those things. So you start recognizing these things in your, your DNA and you say, I'm going to separate these things. I'm going to sever these things off of me. God says that when such a person will not die for his father's iniquity, he will certainly live. As for his father, he will die for his own iniquity because he practiced fraud, robbed his brother, and did what was wrong among his people. But you may ask, why doesn't the son suffer punishment for the father's iniquity? Okay, so this, this is where I'm going with this. Like I said, it will keep traveling down as long as that DNA, as long as those um, generations recognize it or don't recognize it and just keep, it keeps multiplying. But if one will stand up and say, no, 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 not this house, not anymore, not my bloodline. It says, since the son has done what is right and just, carefully observing my statutes, he will certainly live. The person who sins is the one who will die. A son won't suffer punishment for the father's iniquity, and a father won't suffer punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous person will be on him, and the wickedness of the wicked person will be on him. Now, if the wicked person turns from his sins and keeps all the statutes, he will certainly live and not die. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's go down. It's just saying the same kind of thing. But you say the Lord's way isn't fair. Now listen, house of Israel, it, it is my way. Wait, is it my way that is unfair? Instead, isn't it your ways that are unfair? When a righteous person turns from his righteousness and practices iniquity, he will die for this. He will die because of the iniquity he has practiced. But if a wicked person turns from the wickedness he's committed and does what is just and right, he will preserve his life. God's saying, I'm fair here. If you will turn, I will preserve your life. I'm fair, you know? Um, but the house of Israel says the Lord's way isn't fair. Um, so God says he'll judge each of you according to your ways. And this is the declaration of the Lord. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so they will not be a stumbling block that causes your punishment. Throw off all transgressions. Throw them off that you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die? For I take no pleasure in anyone's death. This is the declaration of the Lord. So repent and live. This message today is a call to repent. I talked to a boy the other night. And um, this boy actively does drugs and drinks and does all kind of things like that. And I said, I said, how can you... And he, but he's telling me, oh, Christian, I, I'm saved. I'm good. Like, he does not live for the Lord. But he says, I say my prayers every night. And I said, well, what kind of prayers are you praying? You know, like, what, what kind of evidence do you have that shows this worth? What are your fruits? The Bible says we'll know them by their fruits. Where are your fruits? To show that you belong to God. And he said, well, I ask for forgiveness every night. Or, and I repent. No, I repent every night, he said. And ask for God to forgive me. And I said, do you even know what repentance means? And he says, yeah, to say I'm sorry. And I said, no, that is not what repentance... Well, my husband actually was saying, no, that's not what repentance is. 
repentance is a changing, change of your mind. It is a turning in a new direction. It is not continually going to God and saying, I'm saying I'm sorry now so I can do it again tomorrow, but I won't go to hell. That's not repentance. Repentance, true repentance in the eyes and heart of God is when you will go and you'll say, God, I see this in my life and I do not want it anymore. And sometimes, yeah, the enemy still has legal right, legal right, and he was not going to give up. He's going to keep pecking. He's going to keep pecking until he knows that he, the door is completely shut and locked to him. And then you have victory over it. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You know? So when you repent, God wants you to repent. That doesn't mean saying you're sorry. It means a change of mind, a change of heart. It means a change of life. Not, I see it and it's okay. I told you I was sorry. That's using God. That's trying to use God. That's considering his blood and his grace. That's, that's as worthless. You know, he died to give us power over sin. Not to just keep forgiving us for our dirtiness. It's to clean us up. To clean us up by his blood and eject the enemy out of our life. I am, the church, here I go. The church wants to act like he came to take the penalty of sin away, but not take the sin away. And that's false and it's wrong. Let me tell you, let's think about this for a minute. The, they love, people love to talk about the lady in adultery. Where God says, judge not who, without, who is without sin will cast the first stone. They love to tell that story. But then what did Jesus tell her when he got her alone? He says, go and sin no more. So that you can be saved. He wants to stop the enemy in our spiritual DNA from having access. He wants to stop the enemy from having a legal right to us. To say, this one still belongs to me. I don't know if you noticed. They're full of me. And they love it. They have not turned from me. They have not. Their hearts have not turned to you. They really do actually still belong to me. Their, their mouth speaks one thing. That I'm a Christian. I pray. I say my bedtime prayers. But their life screams darkness. And some people, I'm going to get to that later. Okay, so let's move on. We're talking about spiritual DNA and the legal access the enemy has there and how it will carry down to the third and fourth generations, right? And how that we want to get that off of us. We want to get that off of our children. And we want to, if it's in your parents, we want to get that off of them too because we don't want anything flowing down affecting us. Okay? So, let's talk about something else. I'm going to give you another example. Um, hold on one second. Hush, go lay down. Go lay down. My dogs. Okay, so, let's talk about Ishmael. People know about Ishmael in the Bible? Okay, Abraham was promised a son in his old age. He was like 100 years old. And God's like promising him this son. And they're like waiting, waiting, waiting. And it already seems like impossible because they're so old, right? And so God says, I promised you a son. Like, he, he, there's going to be generations that come from this son. Like, it's, it's coming. So they wait and they wait and they wait. And like most of us, then they start to give up because they don't see God move for this promise. God, when God promises something, it's a promise. I think we all need to get a hold of that. Has he promised you something? That's a promise. Let's think about that for a moment. And so, Sarah and Abraham didn't believe, and they, they started going to their own devices. And I can't help but think, was that the enemy, of course, in their ears saying, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you try that? And so, instead of waiting on God's promise, they went and got the maidservant girl, Hagar, and they brought her into the tent, and they tried to make their own baby. They tried to make the promise come into fruition by their self, without God. And so they produced Ishmael, a baby. Now, this is what I want to address, and I want to be real careful, but I want to tell you something. You know, people always say, you had a baby. It came from God. Like, God gives all life, all babies are a blessing. But I want you to think about Ishmael. I'm sure his mama loved him. His daddy even loved him. Even though they were, I'm sure he repented in his heart that I, you know what, God? Because God did eventually give him the son that he promised. Even after, even after he fell and produced another one, 
God came back and said, I'm still going to give you the promise because it has purpose. And because I'm not a liar, I had to throw my shoe at that doll. So, I'm not a liar. I promised you a son. I'm going to give you a son. Okay? But what happened? Do you know Ishmael came? And do you know what the line of Ishmael produced? We're talking about generational here. We're talking about spiritual DNA that passes down the generations. The line of Ishmael is where the line of Islam comes from. Okay? So... A lot. Some people don't know that. I didn't know that till a couple years ago. I just somebody was talking about. It. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa! I never realized this. Okay, so they had this baby outside of the will of God, which, like I said, I'm sure the enemy was there. Do this, do that. Try to have your own baby. God will be fine with that. That's what he was talking about. Like trying to convince you of something else. So they go have this baby, and now the Bible says, let's see. I'm gonna tell you. This is what, let me just read what the Bible says about Ishmael, okay? The angel of the Lord said to her, Hagar, you must go back to your mis uh, your mistress, that would be Sarah, Abraham's wife, and submit to her mistreatment. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring. offspring. So that tells you, I will greatly multiply your offspring and they will be too many to count. That tells you that Ishmael was going to have some generational things happen, right? He's going to have generations also that are going to suffer for the sin of their father. Okay. And the angel of the Lord said to her. You have conceived and will have a son. You will name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. God will give you the fruits. Just because a baby's born. Doesn't mean it was born out of God's will. Okay. So this man will be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone. Doesn't that make sense? This is where the line. The, Muslim, the Islam comes from. Um, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live at odds with all his brothers. So this goes to tell you the sins of the fathers, how far down and how great the sins of the fathers can be as they pass down, and how much trouble they can wreak in the world. Okay, so we've got to repent, people. We've got to make sure that we repent. And we've got to make sure that we live in holiness so that we are not reproducing down our bloodline sin and darkness to carry on in our children. You know, I had a child out of wedlock, my first, and he is a blessing to me. So I'm, don't get mad at me for saying all babies born are not sent of a blessing of God because I was a single mother. Okay, so please don't get bent out of shape when I say that. I understand. My baby is a blessing to me. I love him more than anything. He helped me probably stay alive because I was on, doing some really bad things at that time and some really dark things. And um, he helped me get out of that because I had to live for him, you know. And so um, I had a responsibility. So, And he is a blessing for me and God because, though, I believe... Because I repented and turned to God, my baby now, him, he and my other ones, they don't have to still, they don't have to be drug addicts, I'm going to say it. They don't have to live that life. They don't have to live the life of robbing and cheating and lying, okay? They don't have to worry about that. Because when I got saved, I said, hold on a second. I started learning about spiritual DNA. I said, hold on a second. I know what's in me. And I know what was in his dad. And thank God, God has changed all that. But I said, this is not Satan. I rebuke you. I bind you. Whatever I got, you get out. And God, I thank you for blocking every negative thing the enemy used me to do. Do not let it carry out into my children. I block it with your blood, Jesus. None of that has any right to pass down to them anymore because I renounce it. It is not a part of me anymore. But what had happened, what would happen if I got saved, I went, I turned to God, but I still held on to maybe the addiction of alcohol. And I still continued to drink because let me tell you something. After I got saved, I did continue to drink because I'd say he made, he made alcohol at the wedding and it must be all right, which I did a deeper study in that. And it'll change your mind if you actually choose to do a deeper study into that. But anyway, um, 
But God would always convict me. I'm like, God, why are you convicting me? I mean, you, you know, you said I could have a little glass of wine here there as long as I didn't get drunk. But let me tell you something. God wants to protect my bloodline from the addiction that's in it. And it, it ain't in me. It's in other ones, too. All in my family. There is such addiction. People have died from uh, substance abuse. And you know what? That could be my babies. So is it worth it to me to have a little sippy sip here or there? No, it's not. Because you know why? That devil don't have no right in my life. You better get on. That's how I look at that. You think I'm going to sit here and take a, and give the enemy access? When I know he travels down the bloodline. And you know what? He don't have no right to my kids. I, there's not going to be one yes inside of me when it comes to my kids, to the enemy. Nope. Spirit of addiction, you have no right here. You don't have no right to them. They don't belong to you. They covered under the blood of Christ. And I did not give you legal right to be here anymore when I took him on. So God would convict me. I repented. I said, I'll never touch it again. I had never touched it again. Because he knew, God knew, you better shut the door to this devil. Don't you give him no right here. You know, and there's things that I see that are in my, my family or things that I can see passed down from us that we have not totally, even like spirit of fear that comes into it. Sometimes the spirit of fear will come over us and it's like a tangible presence, you know. It's, it's anxiety and fear that comes out of nowhere. That's a spirit. You know what, it doesn't have right. So sometimes I'll see it get on my children and maybe an insecurity or things like that and I recognize it. So you know what, parents? We got to make sure. We got to make sure to handle these things in our life for our children's sake. You know? Um, even like there's some things like um, I know someone who's, uh, who's dealt with the spirit of fear pretty strongly. And whose parents were in the church, very strong and active in the church. And he, he, he said to me once, um, I wish my parents had recognized this. Anger, even, things like that. I wish my parents had recognized this in me as a child because they were believers and handled it right then. He said, because they never prayed over me. They never, they never came to me, laid hands on me, and said, you know what, you have, this thing has no right here. Because you know why? It probably still had right in their life. So now it's passed down to this person who has struggled and struggled and struggled to try to eject this thing out of their life. So it's so important that we clean ourselves up. Clean your spirit up. The Bible says without spot or blemish. That's what he's looking for. You know? And, and if we will take it to clean ourselves up so that our children will not have to suffer these things. We'll sh we're systematically shutting and locking every door to the enemy in Jesus' name. It's so important. Because... The enemy wants to use what's in your blood, what's in your spiritual DNA to pass it to your children. And if you need to do it for God first and also for your children second. Because I know you love those kids. I love my kids. And I want my DNA to glorify God in every way possible. Okay? So that I was talking about Ishmael for some of y'all that's just tuning in. I was talking about Ishmael and how... They went out of the will of God to have Ishmael, and the generations of Ishmael carried down to the, the nation of Islam. And we see all the trouble that we're having with that. Okay, so that's how important it is that you look after uh, your uh, obedience to God so that it doesn't carry down into your generations and generations. Um, but then now, I want to show you the line of Seth. Let's get back on another foot. And let's look at the line of Seth. It's pretty exciting. So, um, in Genesis... Is that where I am? Yeah. Genesis 4. Okay? Go to 4 and 25. Now, we know the story of Adam and Eve. We all know the story of Cain and Abel. One second. We all know the story... Of Cain and Abel, right? Cain killed Abel, murdered his brother, right? And then all this oh, terrible stuff. So that happened. But then the Bible says that Adam and Eve came together and they made a son named Seth. All right? And I found it interesting in the Bible that there was two things I found interesting. It says, um, Adam knew his wife intimately again and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. Uh, for she said, God has given me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. 
A son was born to Seth also, and he named him Enosh. At the time, people began to call again on the name of the Lord. So isn't that awesome? Like, they had all this junk that they had dealt with. But then here comes this new lineage that begins to call on the name of the Lord again. And what I really also found interesting is then if you go down to 5.1, it says, These are the family records of the descendants of Adam. On the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. When they were created, he blessed them and called them Adam. It says, so this is where like the lineage starts. It doesn't even mention Cain nor Abel. It says, Adam was 130 years old when he fathered a child in his likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. I found that very interesting. Like, there was no lineage for Abel because he was murdered. So it didn't mention him. This is talking about lineage. This is talking about spiritual DNA. This is talking about generations. And it doesn't mention Cain because it wasn't a lineage worth talking about. It wasn't a lineage for God. Okay, so it says Adam lived 800 years after the birth of Seth, and he fathered sons and daughters. So Adam's life lasted 930 years until he died. And then it says Seth was 105 years old when he fathered Enosh, and Seth lived. And it goes down, and it tells you, fathered so-and-so, they lived so many years, and then they died. And then that son lived, had fathered so-and-so, and then they died. So it goes on and tells you, like, the lifespan. So this is what I found cool. So then now you have this awesome, like, this God lineage that starts with Seth. And it goes down to Enoch, okay? Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. And after the birth of Methuselah, listen, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. So watch this, watch. Enoch walked with God and he was not there because God took him. Enoch didn't even die. He did not have to taste death because he was such a good man. Because this awesome lineage carried down. It created this holy man called Enoch. And Enoch did not even have to taste death. It says that God took him up bodily. Right? It's in Hebrews 11.5 as well. I can go find that real quick and read that to you. Hebrews 11.5. It says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not experience death and he was not to be found because God took him away. Before prior to his transformation, he was approved, having pleased God. Now, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. Which I find this interesting that it's not just about belief. A lot of people say, all you got to do is believe and you're saved. Well, it says prior to his transformation, he was approved, having pleased God. Now, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So he had faith. And he was obedient to God. It wasn't just about, everybody who believes is not pleasing to God, you know. So this guy here, the blessed lineage, um, didn't even have to taste death. So then look at this. So he was such a good man, such a blessed man, he fathered Methuselah. And Methuselah's life lasted 969 years and then he died. He was the oldest living man in the Bible. So I think that's really cool how you can see the difference in a cursed lineage and you can see the difference in a blessed lineage, right? And so um, there's a lot to study. Like when you start thinking about like generational curses and things like that, um, generational curses, when people, you ever hear that term, that means in your spiritual DNA, things get passed down. Like I was talking about addiction, just different things like that, lust, um, things like that. And um, so you got to be careful what you pass down. You got to get clean so that you don't pass it to your kids, right? Um, you know, some people question, and I'm going to say it, I'm probably, I, I'm going to make some people upset, but that's okay. Um, people question, like, are homosexuals born that way? Some, some are born that way. They come out of the womb acting effeminate or acting, you know, masculine for the females. And they say, well, they were born that way. God must have made them that way. Well, when you know what you're talking about with spiritual DNA, you understand 
that there are sins of the fathers that pass down into these children. And yeah, they're born that way. But does that mean it's blessed of God? Does that mean it was a blessed lineage? Or does that mean that was a cursed lineage? Think about that. If we're sitting here, I'm giving you background. And I'm giving you examples of these lineages in the spirit, the spiritual lineage. That's where it comes from. And it doesn't mean it's okay with God just because they were born that way. Right? Just like if I was born with, um, let's go back to addiction because that's just the easiest one. And I, yeah, it, it was in me. So, um, does that mean that God was pleased that I was an addict? Does that mean that he overlooked it and said, well, she was, I made her that way. Did God make me that way with addiction? Did God, that, was that God's will to let me be born with addiction? The Bible says we're all born with sin because we have a sin nature because of what happened in that garden. The lineage we inherited in that garden, we are born with sin. But when we come to Christ, we are born again. We are to be born again. We take on his blood and we inherit a new life. And so all that other thing, all the other things start falling away because they're not pleasing to God. And those very things that, that are strong in our life that we respond to and react to the enemy in our life is the very things that will cause us to be lost and go to hell. So, um... I'm telling y'all, the enemy didn't want this to get out. There keeps being more and more distractions. My dogs are killing me today. I am sorry. I'm going to have to find something to do with them while I do this. Something different. Okay, so we talked about this blessed lineage of Seth, right? And then, um, that was like thousands, thousands. Keep in mind, the Bible makes it look like it's just a hop, skip, and a jump. But that was thousands and thousands of years of blessing on the DNA. But then... We start, then comes Noah, right? And the Bible says that at that time, the earth was full of darkness and violence. Okay? And so, here comes Noah. And it says in all the earth, he found one man. Okay, so you look back, that's thousands and thousands of years going on. So that meant there are thousands and thousands of people on the earth. There wasn't just like five. Okay? So, when you see that, how dark the earth can get and how few there can be that actually please God. It's, it's kind of frightening. You know, I urge you, please, be the one that stands out to God. Be the one when his eyes search to and fro on this earth, looking for those whose hearts are truly his. Be one of those that his, his gaze stops on and he says, that one right there, that one right there is my heart. That one right there honors me and seeks to please me. That one right there set themselves apart. That one right there recognized the enemy in their life and they extinguished him for my sake. Be that one. If it's just you, if it's just you, live like if it is just me, it's going to be just me. I, I will, if no one else will, if everybody else I know is, is, is sleeping around, if everyone I else know is drinking and doing drugs, if everyone I else know lies and, and, and gossips, if everyone else is doing things that I know are not pleasing to God, I will stand. I will be the light in the darkness. Me. If I have to. I have to. And my children and their children will not suffer what I suffered and they will have a chance to be saved, a better chance to be saved. Because I refuse the enemy in my bloodline. Um, hold on. So, here we go to Noah, right? One man God found. And he allowed him to bring his three sons and their wives and his wife onto the ark. When they get off the ark, you think they're doing good. It never takes man very long to start messing things up. We just do it. We It never it never fails. It, you leave it in our hands very long, and we just start kicking up some trouble. And God's like, oh, here we go again. So we have Noah and his sons. And, and after he gets off the boat, he goes, and he's laying in his tent, and he doesn't have any clothes on. And so Ham comes in and finds him. And he's like looking and he's laughing and this and that. And he goes and tells his brother to kind of bring them in there and be like, look, look, look at dad. You know, like he's naked in there. And those sons had such honor and holiness and righteousness in their heart that they turned backwards and they brought a blanket or a cloak and they covered him up. They refused the sin there. And so 
when you study the lineage of Seth, you see the things that came down from their lineage were darkness. His lineage was darkness. Um, he produced the Philistines, which were people in a nation that were against God and God's people for, for years. They were at war with God. Um, Babylon, um, which the Bible calls the mistress, mistress of kingdoms. Babylon the Great is known for astrology and divination. It's known for witchcraft. Babylon was sin. Like you, It's a representation of sin. Um, Tower of Babel. Um, all these people in these places came down from him, which means confusion, you know. And, and, and you got to think about this. So Ham did this one thing that displeased the Lord, and it began to trickle down his DNA and made kingdoms of darkness. It didn't just affect two or three kids. It affected kingdoms of darkness that would war against God's people, just like Ishmael, the Muslims, Islam. It wars against God's people. It is so, so important that you see to it that your bloodline honors God. Please, clean yourself up. Clean yourself from the darkness so that everyone under you can serve God. And, 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 and the enemy does not get glory here. You know, that's all he wants is to sit one little seed in you that you say, yep, let me water this seed. And as you're watering the seed, it's growing. And you think it's just you, but it's drop seeds down your bloodline. And they're going to suffer, you know, and possibly be very lost ultimately over it. So, let's see. So somebody might say, you know, even Christians' kids go off into darkness, you know. So just because you live for God doesn't mean your bloodline is going to live for God. And yeah, that's right. That's true. That happens. But that is on that child to make that decision. You need to know that you did everything you can do for these children to be clean and holy. And I'm not talking about in front of everybody. I'm talking about behind closed doors, right? Because... There's many things I want to touch. God's been telling me to tell y'all this. There's some people that sit back and they say, I didn't inher inherit none of that bad stuff. I inherited a mama or a daddy or my parents taught me to go to church every Sunday. But that ain't always good. Because if that's all they taught you, they taught you to have a religious spirit that goes to church and lives like darkness behind closed doors. Y'all at church every Sunday, but you cuss and you have a mouth and a heart full of darkness when you speak. I hope it hurts your feelings because you need to be convicted. You can go to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, and every revival they have. You can be at every potluck. You can be at every prayer meeting, which you're probably not going to show up for the prayer meeting. But let me say this. You can have a religious spirit that serves I don't think they're serving God. I think it's, it's serving yourself. And it's, it, you can be moral, but you're not holy. I want to raise kids that, that don't do, they, they don't do good because it's a good thing to do. It's just what we do. It's what I do. So I'm telling you, you need to do that. I want them to live holy because it pleases the heart of God. I want them to be grieved in their heart when they do something wrong to say, oh gosh, I feel his displeasure. He's not pleased with me. I don't want them to, to, to be robotic. I don't want them to make mental decisions. As, we do not do this. We do not do that because the word said it's not about that because you know what? If it's up here, it's not here. And it's not here. And if it's up here, it doesn't count because you're not doing it in the right way. You're doing it because it's a good decision to do. And it's your heart's not for God. Your heart's for religion. Your heart's for what people see. And it never goes very deep. Because you're not truly grieved when you sin. And that's a sign that you have a religious spirit. And you were raised down with a religious spirit. Is that you can go to church every Sunday. And not be grieved that you look like the world behind closed doors. Or outside of the church doors. So that's something you inherited. The ability to go to church. But not truly have your heart for God. And that's a spirit. It's the spirit, same spirit of the Pharisees. The Bible talks about the spirit of the Pharisees. And you need to, to repent over that. We all need to repent over that. Because we can all get kind of, 
You know, I had to go through a phase with my own son where I kind of tried to force him to live for God. You know, I'd say, like, you cannot do this because, you know, you cannot, and you must live like this because, and you know what I did? I didn't give him any grace whatsoever to let God speak to him. I didn't give him grace to hear from God. I didn't give him grace. So now, you know what? God told me. He said, he's my child. He said, I know how to draw a heart, and I'm going to draw his heart, and I'm going to make see to it that he loves me. It's not your place to make my child love me. So some of y'all sitting there forcing their kids to go to church when you're forcing them to have a religious spirit, and they're doing it out of uh, uh, just habit instead of out of their heart. And they're doing it because they fit in with the church crew, and that's all their friends and their, you know, their lifestyle. But is their heart there? You know, is their heart truly grief? Like, do they, do they love like Jesus loves? You know, and so... I remember that I had get, I told when I got saved and I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I told the Lord, I said, he's yours. Caleb is yours. I dedicated my child and I've done my best to live my life. And I'm still got some things that I, I'm seeing and I am, I'm plucking them. I'm uprooting them. I'm, I'm going to keep uprooting until they don't come back until they say, you know what? This thing is dead. She don't, she's not going to allow it here. So we're not going to grow anymore. It's not going to grow anymore. Kind of like, I was talking to somebody the other day about um, plucking your eyebrows. You can pluck your eyebrows, but after a while, that hair stops growing back because it sees like it dies because there's you keep plucking it. And that's the same thing with the enemy. If you will keep plucking him out and saying, nope, 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 nope. I see you. I even acted with you for a minute. Nope, nope, nope. That's not going to happen anymore. Forgive me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. I don't want this in my life. Get rid of the junk in your blood. Get rid of the junk in your soul. You know? Um, so anyway, here's our hope. When we become believers in Christ and we say, God, I'm yours. Take my life. Make it yours. And then when we, um, you know, get baptized, get filled with the Holy Ghost, all these good things, and we start living for God, we are now a new creation. And the Bible says that our inheritance is now in Him. And I, His blood, let's see. His blood is in 2 Corinthians. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you get truly saved, that's the danger of living in church your whole life, is you grew up thinking you were saved all this time, and you never really grieved over the sin because you never really truly felt like you were lost. That's the danger of growing up in church your entire life. And so you become robotic. And you just do what you've always done. It was never a heart change. You were never caught. You were never made new. You still just kind of carried on what you did your whole life, right? So this says, "Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new." You start seeing through new eyes, and you start seeing things that you never saw before. I used to live in so much sin. I was covered in so much darkness. I don't even reckon. Like, I look back at the things I used to do, and I'm like, "Oh, I'm embarrassed for myself. I'm uh, shamed because." The darkness that I allowed in my life, and I never thought of it, any of it was wrong. Like, I just lived that life. I thought that was normal. I thought it was natural, you know? There was no conviction. Well, as soon as, like, God came into my life, it's like, like, some blinders came up. And I was like, oh, that doesn't feel good. Oh, he doesn't like, I know God doesn't like that. I don't want anything to do with it. And then you something else, and you're like, oh, that's in me. I know God's not pleased with that. That's got to go. I don't want anything that displeases his heart. You, put, When the Holy Spirit comes in you, for real, for real, you are convicted of sin. You want to please God because a holy God is now taking up residence in you. Sin is not okay. So if you go to church every Sunday and behind closed doors, you're cussing, you're listening to worldly music, you're watching shows that displease the heart of God, you're being entertained, which means you're soaking up things that the devil authored. You need to, to really repent and you need to say, God, I don't know. I don't know if my heart's right. I don't know if my DNA that I, I inherited is of you or did I inherit a religious spirit. I, I, God told me to get on this. That's the only reason I keep talking about it. He told me way earlier, this is what you need to touch on. Because people don't even realize. They think they're doing good by doing their duty, by being in a church every Sunday. And in reality, that's all they're doing. They're going through the motions. They're playing church. They're not being church. They're not being Jesus. Jesus is a duty, not a lifestyle, not a love story. 
not a not a, a new thing that consumes you you know and so that religious spirit is very strong because you it's never convinced that it might be lost because it always sat on that pew so it's kind of good in the background god saw my um my uh roll call i was here basically roll call i was always there so i'm good with god but that's not the fact the fact is you can be raised in church your whole life and you can be full of darkness and not truly have a heart for god and that is something you need to recognize and say you know what you're right i go through the motions but I really don't, it does not grieve me to grieve the heart of God. That means you have a religious spirit. And, and, and God can take that from you and he can transform your heart where it, it beats and burns for him. And that's what we want. I, I, I ask God for the grace to come against that spirit today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Um, so anyway, so we're talking about the blood. That's our hope. When you take on the blood of Christ, it can do anything. It starts to clean you up, but you got to let it clean you up. Because anything you're still clinging on to gives the devil legal right to be in your life. Hurry up. Go on. That's my beautiful son. We're live, okay? All right. So I'm going to talk about um, just two more. I'm going to go through two more scriptures and then I'm done that I know of. I want to go to nine, uh, John 9, 1 through 2. There's a story about a man that was born blind. And uh, he was passing by. Jesus was passing by. Go. No. Jesus was passing by. Go around. And um, his disciples questioned him. They said, Rabbi, talking to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So that's just further proof for you. Proof for you that the generational things that can pass down. It can be diseases. Did you know? Those diseases. Was it say? Look, you need to link this up right here. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Your sin is an open door for disease and sickness. Because where does that come from? Satan. Where did we start dying? In the garden when we listened to Satan. Our body started dying and being able to be attacked by disease. Satan, comes, Satan brings disease. Okay? Sin brings disease. It's an open door. I've heard stories about revivalists who have a strong healing calling on their life strong healing ministry and they would they would minister to people and they would say is there any open door to sin in your life before we sit here and we lay hands on you and you have not been able to be healed you need to repent if there's anything God's bringing up to you right now just repent and the ones that refused to repent would not get healed and they said the ones that truly repented from their heart would be healed so talking about spiritual DNA and lineage and generations You've got these sins in your life, like I said earlier. It doesn't always mean that because you're a liar, your son's going to be a liar. You could be welcoming cancer into their life. You could be welcoming diabetes. You could be welcoming anything, blindness, you know. But that goes to show you, we, t we talk about something real here. It's all in the Bible. I'm not making it up. It's real. So I'm going to last. I'm going to go. And I'm going to show you the lesson in it all. Like I've been saying, and Eli, and talking about Eli and his sons, he was a priest in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 2 and 12. So get this, talking about the religious spirit, how dangerous it can be. Eli was a priest. His sons were priests also. It says Eli's sons were wicked men. Priests were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord or for the priest's share of the sacrifices from the people. When any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged meat pork and while the meat was boiling and plunge it into the container and the kettle or the cooking pot. The priest would claim for himself what, whatever meat um, the fort bro brought up. So basically, the priest were supposed to have the meat, but the way that God wanted it done is they would plunge a fork into the broth and whatever came out was given to the priest. That's what God shared for him. Okay? So... But Eli's sons would come even before the fat was burned. And um, they would say to the man who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat to roast because we won't accept boiled meat, only raw. So they would come up and say, I want that right there. They got to pick what they wanted. They picked and choose what they wanted. If that's not a message in itself, there you go. You in church all the time and you picking and choosing what you want. All right? So anyway... Um, no, I insist you hand it over right now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. So they're sitting there threatening people, things like that. And these are people of God, you know? So, um, so the servant's sin was very severe in the presence of the Lord because they treated the Lord's offering 
with contempt. And to treat something with contempt is to treat something as worthless. That's what the Bible says deliberate sin does. Deliberate sin is to treat uh, the blood and the Holy Spirit with contempt. It says that in Hebrews 10, uh, around 26 or so. Deliberate sin is to treat God's blood and His grace and the Holy Spirit with contempt as worthless. Profane them. Okay? So watch this. So now you skip over to 1 Samuel 2, 22 through 35, and it tells you what happened to Eli and his sons. Okay? Eli was a man of God. He saw his sons going down this path. All right, it says, now Eli was very old. He heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they were sleeping with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He said to them, why are you doing these things? I've heard about your evil actions from all these people. No, my sons, the report I hear from the Lord's people is not good. If a man sins against another man, God can intercede for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to their father since the Lord intended to kill them. Um, by contrast, the boy Samuel grew in stature. Blah, blah, okay, so a man of God came to Eli and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Didn't I reveal myself to your ancestral house when it was in Egypt and belonged to Pharaoh's palace? Out of the tribes of Israel, I selected your house to be priests, to offer sacrifices, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod in my presence. I gave your house all of the fire offerings. He said, I gave you all these wonderful things. Why then do you despise my sacrifices and offerings that I require at the place of worship? You have honored your sons more than me by making yourselves fat with the best part of the offerings of my people of Israel. Therefore, this is the declaration of the Lord. Although I said your family and your ancestral house would walk before me always, so we're talking about the generations now. The Lord says, no longer. I will honor those who honor me, but those who despise me will be disgraced. Look, the days are coming where I will cut off your strength and the strength of your ancestral family so that none in your family will reach old age. Remember we talked earlier about Enoch and then Methuselah and how Enoch didn't even have to taste death, but Methuselah was the longest living man in the Bible that blessed lineage. All right, so it says, um, none in your family will reach old age. This is the cursed lineage. Any man from your family I do not cut off from my altar will bring grief and sadness to you. All your descendants will die violently. This will be a sign that you have come, that will come to you concerning your two sons because of two. Both of them will die on the same day. Then I will raise up a faithful priest for myself. He will do whatever is in my heart and my mind. I will establish a lasting dynasty for him and he will walk before my anointed one for all time. So there you go. The Bible says, I read, read my study notes, and it is just a, you know, a personal opinion, but it said that why, did, why didn't Eli try to talk to them and tell them? But to me, well, actually, I just, I just got revelation. It said that, but he didn't force them to stop. But I don't know that that's true because I was just thinking, and God just, I think, revealed to me. It says that he took part in eating the meat that they were taking. So he still had those open doors to the enemy. He still let the darkness flow down to his sons. He didn't cut it off even for himself to see to it that it stopped and didn't save his lineage. And all this, they didn't immediately die. It carried down and they were cursed down their lineage because of what they did today. Tomorrow, forever, their lineage would be cursed. And only by the grace of God would one rise up and turn to God. Only by his goodness and mercy, you know. So, um, like I said, the enemy's never going to stop fighting for you. He wants legal access to your soul and the souls of your children and their children and their children. And he wants that because he wants to steal everything that could belong to God. And I pray that there were you get something out of this. I'm sorry about the many distractions. I'm very upset about it, but I carried on because I knew that God wanted me to. And you got to be very careful what you've let in your life. It's not just about you. It will go down to your babies and your babies' babies and their babies. And you don't want that. I know you don't. You love your kids. You love your grandbabies. You love your you you love whatever's theirs and whatever they love. But you know what? You love God. You want your lineage to represent him well, don't you? I do. You know, my children aren't perfect. They may not all live for God at this moment. But you know what? I will face the Lord. And I will be able to say, I got it all out as much as I could. I did my part, God. You know what? Because I did my part, I know God's going to be blessed. He's going to bless my lineage. I know he is. 
But let me tell you something else. How important is it to you that your lineage is blessed? You know, like I said, you can be fighting things today that your grandparents, your great, 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 great grandparents did because you never broke that off of yourself. There's a teaching that says, um, it's called the courts of heaven. It's really interesting, but they tell you, go get in your prayer closet, come before God and say, God, I ask you to cover in your blood everything all the way back to Adam. Cover, get it all taken care of. You know what I mean? Like, leave no room here for the enemy. So I go back to, to Adam and Eve. And I ask you to break off every curse that has come down. Now the problem is when you got parents that are still like doing some things that they're not supposed to be doing, it still keeps coming trying to tag you. But you know what I say? Fast for your parents. Fast for your grandparents. Fast for those in your lineage, in your family who still have sin. Let's fast for them because they can't see it. So you begin to fast for them and God's going to start moving in your favor and he's going to begin revealing to them and they're going to be in a change. And then they're going to be blessed. They're going to not have to worry about the curse and neither will your bloodline. You know, so even for your children or your children lost, how many times have you fasted for them? You know, um, your brothers, your sisters, you love them. Have you fasted for them? Do you want their lineage to be blessed? I mean, this is just common to me right now. You love them. Don't you want their lineage? Don't you want your bloodline to be blessed in them? You want to see their babies uh, live for God and, 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 and be blessed? I do. I don't want to see them cursed. You know? Whoever it is, like, let's take this seriously. When you inherited the name of Christ, you didn't just inherit heaven. You inherited a responsibility. You inherited a kingdom. And that kingdom is your responsibility. And, and you know, there's so many people out there that you love that are under your realm of influence, your circle, and you know they're lost. How, how seriously did you take it? Did you, did you fast? The Bible says some things only come out by prayer and fasting. That's in the Bible. Did you fast? How important was it that that child didn't live on in sin? How important is it that your, 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 your brother be saved? Did you fast for him? On judgment day, when you're standing next to your family member who's not going to make it, you, you're there before God. God's eyes are on you. Your eyes are on them. And they're looking at you, and they're about to be lost and you know there's nothing standing between you and that person. And they know you never fasted. You never prayed. Like you didn't speak to me. You didn't try to reach out to me. You didn't tell me the truth. Why? Forget how hard-headed I was. Forget how stubborn I was. Forget that I might have gotten mad at you. But you never, you never reached out like you could have. Please. I'm begging you. There's lost people out there. We went to watch fireworks yesterday. I just looked around and everybody was just, there were so many people drunk and they were just just worldly walking around with everything hanging out and I said I don't want you God where where are your people how futurely want you anymore God this world is dark and like I said, we inherited a kingdom. It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility. Fast. Fast for the lost. Pray for the lost. Reach out to the lost. Forget your... Uh, forget your self-image. Forget it. Don't, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm scared. Like, I have... Let me tell you. I have a spirit of rejection that... It, that attacks me and it's so afraid to be rejected by people. You might not know that about me. God revealed it to me several years ago and ever since then I've been systematically shutting the door to it. But I recognize it when it comes to sharing the gospel on a, like to strangers. That's where it comes against me. And even to the ones I love because I'm so like the fact that they might reject me like hurts in my heart. But you know what? If I see that there God's letting me see that that is something that needs to go. What's in your life that needs to go so that God can use you? What's in your life that the enemy has legal ground to be there because you recognize them and you let him stay? 
cleanse your bloodline. Get it all out. Go before the throne. Clean it out from Adam and Eve all the way to you. And then do the work. Do the work for yourself, for your babies and their babies. Do the work. You know, let God have you. That's the work. Let God have you. That's the good works. I belong to God, and I'm getting rid of the enemy. He's got to go. He's not welcome here anymore. And you'll be able to stand before God, and you'll be able to look him in the eye, and you'll be able to say, it meant something to me that we would live for you. My lineage would, will glorify the Lord. My lineage will glorify the Lord. And so, that's pretty much it. Like I said, if anybody chooses to go back and watch, I'm sorry for all the distractions. It was a mess. But you know what? The enemy did not want this to come out because it, it, it's, it's revealing some things that people need to hear. Thank you, Jesus. I pray for every person that's watching, I pray, Lord, that, that you just prick their heart deeply, Lord. Give them, give them thoughts about this, Lord. Just really talk to them about it, Jesus. Thank you. I love you guys. Y'all have a great day. Talk to you soon.